soldiers would smuggle bottles of booze into the camp by putting it into their boots, boot legging. You did that in high school too, right? Yeah. Is that what yeah we right. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. This episode is our 222nd episode, and the guest today is Brad Holden. Brad is a Seattle area author who has three books out that all cover the Seattle area during the prohibition time of our history. And they're fascinating stories. Brad's a great storyteller. I think you're really going to enjoy listening to Brad as he tells tales about prohibition in the greater Seattle area. Brad's also a podcast host. He has a a, a podcast about dive bars and other drinking establishments in the Seattle area called Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks. Um, Really enjoyable podcast. You should check it out as well. But before we get started, just got a favor to ask you, if you could share the podcast with somebody else who might enjoy listening to it. And if you'd be so kind as to leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on, we'd really appreciate that because it means a lot to get feedback on what we're doing right, what we're not doing right, and we're always looking to improve. So without further ado, we're going to jump into the episode with Brad Holden. Well, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. This is going to be episode 222, and my guest today is Brad Holden. Brad, I'm going to read something off your bio to kind of introduce you because it sums it up better than I probably can. So whoever wrote this for you, well, you're an author, so I guess maybe you wrote it. All right. Your bio says, author, historian, finder of old things. I love that. I just think that's very cool. So welcome. Why don't you expand on... Finder of old things, historian and author. How'd you get started? It started with the finder of old things part. That's where it all started. Um, So when I was a kid, my stepdad collected and restored old cars. And so as a result, we were always going to flea markets, swap meets and stuff like that, looking for old car parts. And so I'd always tag along and, you know, they'd throw me a few dollars and then I'd go see what I could (laughs) buy with that and so I, you know i was looking through old toys and yeah. comic books and stuff like that and i always enjoyed that uh so it's something that always stuck with me um on and off throughout my life okay and probably about 10 12 years ago or so i got the bug again the the picker <laughs> bug and this time <laughs> i was going out and what i really enjoyed finding was old artifacts and interesting items from seattle's past because okay. i liked finding stuff like this this is cool what is this and then bringing it home and researching the story behind it and a lot of times you know you'd find some really cool story that had never been told before by researching these artifacts that i was finding um at some point my then high school age daughter um uh instagram had just kind of become a thing (laughs) and she was like you know you should, you should start an Instagram account with this stuff. Cause I think people would really like it. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah. So she helped me start an Instagram account where I started showing pictures of the stuff that I was finding and kind of the story behind it and stuff. And at first I was like, you know, maybe 30 people become interested in it. That'll be great. That'll be a success. Um, but right away it pretty much blew up pretty fast. And people really uh, enjoyed kind of going along and seeing what I was going to find next and what was going to turn up. So it became really popular. So I was doing that for a few years. And then somewhere along the way, I was at an estate sale and I found this old moonshine still down in the basement of this house. And I knew what it was right away because I've always kind of been into prohibition history. And uh, so I was like, well, this is really cool. What else is down here? If this is down <laughs> here, what else can I find? So I started looking around and I found this box of documents, uh, including these papers that basically told the story of the moonshine still, which was this guy was using it to make uh, hooch for the, the local neighborhood. He eventually got caught by the feds and sent to prison. 
but it was a really cool story and it just kind of piqued my curiosity and, and I was thinking, okay, well, I realized that the local story of prohibition has never really been told before, you know, because you, when you hear about prohibition, you always hear about cities like St. Louis and Chicago and New York and you know about those stories, but you don't really hear so much about Seattle or the Pacific Northwest. So that kind of led me down this rabbit hole of research, um, which eventually led to my first book, Seattle Prohibition, Bootleggers, Rum Runners, and Graft in the Queen City. Yeah, I'm and, halfway uh, through that one. <clears throat> oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, are I you enjoying three. it so far? You know, I'll compliment you when we get we get done, because there's some compliments okay. from you on about your writing style. Okay, I, okay, I enjoy cool. it greatly. How's that? Okay, cool, so, cool. Well, let me yeah, ask I, you. So, did, Yeah, go ahead. Are you from Seattle originally? I was born in Seattle, but I was uh, grew up primarily in Spokane. Okay. And when did you move back to the Seattle area? When I was a senior in high school. Okay. That's when my parents, my dad got another job and we moved back here. Uh, and I went to, I graduated from Gig Harbor High School. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I grew up, I grew up in Tacoma as well. Well, not, well you know, I grew up in Tacoma. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. I went to what Franklin. year did you graduate? 80. 80. Okay. I graduated yeah. 87. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you went, okay. So you, you, so after high school, let's, 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 let's derail you here a little bit. So what'd you do after high school? So after high school, I actually joined the air force. Um, and I was in the air force for four years. Uh, I just wanted to get a college education, use yeah. the GI bill and stuff. So that's what I did. And I went around the world. And then, um, when I got out in 92, I moved back to Seattle immediately. I knew that's where I wanted to move back. Cause when, um, when I went into the air force in 88, that's when, um, like a lot of the Seattle mu music, the so-called grunge bands were coming out and I was seeing them before I went in the air force at all these mm -hmm. underground clubs. And I was really into them. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to come back to. You know, okay. I wanted to do my time in the military, but then when I got out, I wanted to come back to this, this magical place. And so that's what I did. And I went to the UW and, um, I got a degree in anthropology of all things. Okay. And, uh, I've been back in Seattle ever since. All so, right. so out of unpacking all of that, two questions for you. When you yeah. were in the military, where did, were you stationed abroad? Did you go any place interesting or were you just you know, stuck on a military base in Georgia or wherever. Uh, no, actually I, I uh, was stationed over in Turkey and it was oh. fantastic. Okay. And this was pre any of the Gulf Wars. So it was very right. safe to travel over there. Um, you could pretty much go wherever you wanted on your off duty hours. And it was fantastic. I had a really great okay. time over there. Yeah. All right. All right. Now here's the hard question. You, okay. you, you were seeing these bands before they became the bands. Yeah. Who was your favorite band back then? Who was the band that you enjoyed seeing? Like when you got to go see them, you're like, hey, this this group's really cool. Soundgarden. Yeah, okay. I remember seeing them when they first came out before they had a, even an LP or an album or anything. And uh, I knew nothing about them. But when I saw them, they just blew my mind. That was, yeah. I was like, this okay. is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, uh, I saw them. I think I saw them. I think it was the Blue Moon Tavern. Oh, did you really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one of my, uh, one of my, my old college roommate, um, was playing in a lot of those bands of that era. Okay. Um, did not hit, you know, that commercial success, uh, during that era, he hit commercial success with a hip hop song in 2013. So, oh, okay. Uh, Which hip hop yes. song? Just out of curiosity. Thrift shop. Oh, okay. So you don't so know more. Yeah. My roommate, the college roommate, uh, is Michael Wansley uh, or Wands, the guy that's saying the hook on thrift shop. The, if you oh, saw the okay. video of the guy in the pink suit, you know, the orange suit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, suit, yeah. yeah. That's, that's my old college roommate. And uh, so I saw my, him live on that tour. And I think they brought that guy out that you were just talking about. Yeah. Did you see him at, um, did you see him at Wamu theater? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we went to that too. And, you know, so it was really interesting to me about that particular show. First off, it was really cool to see my, there's more to the story. Um, uh -huh. but, um, to see your, your buddy who you've known for, you know, let's just say at that time was 30 plus years. Yeah. Hit the pinnacle of, of this and watching him like on Saturday night live and all that was just surreal, but we're standing there at the Wamu theater and we're in the bar and there's okay. nobody in the bar. 
It's like the exact opposite because everyone was under 21. So we just stood oh, in the bar. It was, okay. kind of, it was kind of fun. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I've, I've known Mike um, for 40 years now. That's and very I've cool. Watched, I've watched him play in dozens of bands uh, of a wide, wide genre of music. And uh, he was always my conduit to meeting interesting people in the in the music business. I in bet. Seattle. I yeah. bet. That's really so neat. Like, you like Soundgarden. Okay. So we're like, all right. So then I normally ask this question of musicians, but I'll ask it of you. And I'm going to ask you to answer this back in that era. Okay. okay. So not, not, not today. We'll, we'll okay. cover that one part too. But back in the era, where was the, the venue you liked to see music played at? What was like, what did you like back in the day? Well, you might even remember it. It was in Tacoma. I mentioned that I was uh, living in Gig Harbor yeah. And so the closest, you know, big city was Tacoma, and there was a place called the World Community Theater. You familiar with that? On 56, right off of 56th Street. Uh, I believe so, yeah. Right off of 56 and... Um, yeah, it was, it was an old... Uh, 56 and M. That sounds right. That sounds the reason right, I yeah. know that is because my great... My great aunt and uncle owned that. Oh, no kidding. Back in the thirties and back oh, okay. when it was just, it was a movie theater. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a movie theater. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, they converted into a punk club uh, sometime in the eighties. Okay. And right. uh, I, I saw so many shows there and it was just kind of a magical place, you know, okay. because um, they're, they're basically you'd go there and the guy that owned it would be up front at the ticket counter collecting money. But other than that, there was no authority beyond that. <laughs> There's no bouncers or security or okay. anything like that. So anything could happen and it right. often did. Do you go, I mean, with, with the pandemic, this question's a little harder, but do, do you, do you still go see live music nowadays? Not nearly as much. Okay. Not nearly as much. Yeah. My, um, I've gotten kind of lame. Like my only knowledge of current music is through my, my 21 year old daughter. Okay. She kind of keeps me <laughs> abreast of like what's popular. So, you know, through her, I've, been uh introduced to artists like billy eilish and uh, okay. lana del rey and groups like that that i probably wouldn't even be aware of otherwise but no i don't go see live music nearly as much as uh, i probably should yeah i i living in wenatchee we don't get to see live music as much unless we come over to the to mm -hmm. your side uh, yeah. i still love to go see live music as often as i can though all right so we derailed you so that's okay so after after college your daughter kind of, you know, in, introduces you to Instagram, which is funny because my daughter doesn't let me get on our Instagram account because, of, you know, I'll, I'll just ruin it. You don't want to embarrass uh, her, yeah. Well, she's like, no, Dad, you, you don't know what you're doing. Just stay away. Um, right, right. For the, for the Explore Washington State, I'm not allowed. It's it's pretty fun. Had you ever had any interest in being an author? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I always wanted to be a writer um, huh. pretty much since high school. All right. You know, I was, I was never an athlete. Um, I tried my hand at being a musician. I was a drummer for a while, but I wasn't really good. But the one thing I was, I always was pretty good at was writing. And I was always, those were always kind of the, the people that I idolized were different writers, depending on what phase I was in in life. Um, oh, so, so like, give me some I, examples who, who, who back mm -hmm. in the day, who were you kind of like, who'd you like? Well, it depends. So, um, probably my you know uh late teens early 20s it was of course the different beat writers like jack kerouac and Allen ginsburg yeah. and stuff like that you know i went through that phase like a lot of people do uh, yep, charles Bukowski. uh-huh been there yeah, got that yeah. t-shirt too yeah all right yeah 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 um and then as i've gotten older it's been more into just different probably um different historical writers like Eric Larson, John Krakauer and stuff like that. But I still enjoy the classics. You know, I still look up to people like Hemingway and, right. and people okay. like that. So, yeah. All right. So when you decided to, or, you know, when you executed on, on becoming a writer, mm -hmm. you know, your, your, your bio also talks about Seattle magazine and history link.org and other things like that. Where did you first start getting your, 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 your work published? Did you start in, on a magazine or online or so what, what? 
Yeah, it's just all happened kind of organically. It's fun. It's kind of like how the uh, Instagram account led to me discovering this moonshine still, which led me to eventually writing my first book. And after my first book was published, then that opened even more doors um, through some uh, mutual acquaintances. I, I met the team at History Link mm-hmm. and pitched my ideas to them. And they really liked my what I was some of my ideas. So I started writing for them and I've been writing for them ever since. And it's, it's been wonderful. Um, and then as far as Seattle magazine, uh, the editor of Seattle magazine did a, um, profile on me, uh, a couple years back and we just kind of stayed in touch and they recently relaunched the magazine earlier this year, kind of a new mm-hmm. format with a whole new staff of writers and everything. And he asked me if I'd be willing to come on and, write a column for him. So I was like, sure, that sounds great. So um, yeah, it's just all these opportunities have just kind of opened up unexpectedly. It's been really fun. So your first book, which is the one I'm only halfway through. So okay. I, I read, I read the, the Alfred M Hubbard book first, which was, which I know we're going to get to, but that was what a story. Yeah. As an unpublished author, how hard was it to pitch a historical book to a publisher? Um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I knew a guy that wrote for this, uh, publisher called Arcadia and they published different historical books. They're the ones that published all three of my books so far. Okay. And he had written this book called the uh, brewing history of Seattle. All right. And, um, he kind of encouraged me to pitch my idea to him. So I did. And it was it was somewhat of an intimidating process because you you fill out this proposal form and it's a it's a pretty big form where you kind of sketch out your ideas and what you want to do and how you're going to promote it and all this different stuff, and then the acquisitions editor brings it before a board and they basically <laughs> vote on it. She stands up and okay, Brad Holden <laughs> wants to write this book for us and here's here's what he wants to do, and they vote on it. And luckily for me, you know, they gave me the green light. And it okay. went through. So um, it was it was intimidating, but it went pretty easy overall. Okay. Yeah. Being an author, writing a book is maybe one of the easiest things you can do in the world. Did you notice my tongue planted firmly in my cheek there? <laughs> what was it like for you to to did you do you like do you you enjoy the research part, right? You enjoy yeah. gathering the the tidbits and the stories and crafting them into a cohesive uh, Yeah. Yeah, the research part is, is probably maybe the funnest part okay. of, the, of the process. But as a as a on let's let's talk about your first book, that okay. process. What was was there something about it that you were surprised how challenging it was that you didn't think about? Um probably the deadline is the most challenging part. <laughs> so, you know, they give you a deadline. And once I got the green light and I signed all the paperwork and it was, it was on, then it dawned on me like, okay, I have, you know, uh, I think I had 15 months at that point to finish my research and start writing. So I just hit the the starting line and just went for it. But it's, it's nerve wracking because yeah, you're up against this deadline and you want it to be as great as possible. You're going to put out this first work out into the world and you want it to be well received and um, you don't want to make any big blunders or mistakes. So just trying to go up against the deadline, but to keep that good quality that, Mm -hmm. you know, that you want um, was definitely challenging. Did you meet the deadline? I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. You didn't have to ask for an extension. No. Awesome. No. All right. No, I've met all my deadlines. I can say that I can kind of boast about that. That's very cool. So then after, so you hand the manuscript over to the the team there, they edit it, they give it back Mm -hmm. to you, making some suggestions and some, you know, fixes and all that. Mm -hmm. How long from when you, when you turned the manuscript in the first time to when you saw the first probably printed proof, Mm -hmm. how long of a period was that? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, It's, it was probably about close to eight months. Yeah. Once you've, uh-huh. Okay. So at that time you've been working on this project for, for almost two years, 23, you know, 15 Correct. months to, yeah. 
Yeah. So it's a really, in today's day and age where after five seconds, we've, you know, we've thumbed up or thumbed down something and moved on to right. 32 other little photographs. A couple of your processes is unusual to me. Yeah. I think yeah. it's cool, but it's unusual. How was the editing piece? Once you handed it over, because this is the, the, the reason I'm asking you these questions is I have my pre preconceived notions of how I would feel. And mine is, well, this is my baby and I really want you to be kind to it. Don't, yeah. please don't like hack and slash it. Yeah. But how was the editing process for you? Did Was it fairly painless? Yeah, actually it, w it wasn't too bad. Um, Arcadia, the thing, uh, one great positive thing I'll, I'll say about Arcadia is that they don't, at least for me, they've never gone in and said, no, we don't like this chapter and let's get rid of this. Mm -hmm. Their editing, uh, any of the editing changes was just, you know, if they found some grammatical errors or some typos or anything like right. that, what stuff you want them to find. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You right. know, you want them to find that and correct that kind of stuff. So that's basically all I had to deal with. But other than that, they, they didn't, do any significant changes to, okay. to my manuscript, which was, which was great. That would, yeah, that would be, that would be my fear. So after a couple of years, the book goes to the public, right? Mm -hmm. This is a sad fact. I somewhere, this percentage of people that don't read a book after high school, some staggering number, it's, it's yeah. astronomically large and it's so yeah. sad to me. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're participating in something that doesn't have, mass appeal anymore it just mm -hmm. you know turn it into a, a a netflix series and people will devour it right i actually right. think i actually think that the hubbard book would make a great thank you yeah you know, i've heard I that a lot be, actually yeah yeah it'd be yeah it'd be it's pretty fascinating anyway how was the book in so how was the book received what was it like to be your published author that's that's got to be a cool feeling yeah yeah and did you where where was the first bookstore you saw it on the shelf in? Um, Bartels Drugs actually was the first place I actually saw it on the bookshelf because there's Bartell one kind of close to my house. Yeah, okay. it just happened to okay. pop in one day right after it got published, and there it was. They had a, you know one of those rotating yeah uh, book displays, and I was like, oh, that's cool. That's my book, and it was it was a, quite a feeling. It was a thrill. That's look. Yeah. That's that's very cool because I wouldn't have expected you to say I was gonna expect you to say something like, Oh, I sat down at Elliott Bay or maybe a third <laughs> place, you know, but not Bart I would not have guessed Bartell. That was so the first cool. place, yeah. Yeah, it was All cool. Right. So I'm gonna guess that you got bit by the bug because you've done two more books since then. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling if I asked you, or and I will ask you, you've got plans for anything else coming? I mean, do you do you wanna keep writing? I definitely want to keep writing. Um, I'm taking a little break right now from book writing just because mm -hmm. I, you know, I pumped out three books in the course of, uh, what was it like close to five years? Uh -huh. Um, yeah. yeah and, and so that was, and I look at those three books as kind of my uh, Seattle prohibition trilogy. Cause they all have to do with different parts of Seattle during the prohibition era. So now that I'm done with that trilogy, I'm kind of taking a break and I'm just going to work on my freelancing, you know, my, my, column I write for Seattle Magazine and History Link and things like that. Uh, but I do have plans for future books. I've, um, okay. I'm in talks with a, a local publisher about a couple ideas that I'm uh, exploring. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what awesome. happens. I haven't seen anything. I don't look at Seattle Magazine. So not because I, I just haven't seen it. Um, what's your column in Seattle Magazine? It's called Seattle Artifacts. So okay. it's an extension of what I was doing on Instagram and I've been doing it less and less over the past few years. Cause I've been doing more writing and less uh, finding of old things. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's been cool for that reason because it's kind of resurrected that I original idea I had. So basically the gist of my column is each, <clears throat> each issue, I look at a different artifact and kind of go into the story behind it. Oh, very cool. And at the beginning of, uh, like, for one coming up, the next issue that's coming out um, in a couple months uh, is, is about the Derelict League. We were talking about those, about them <laughs> earlier, about this okay. crazy baseball league that existed in Seattle during the 1970s. So I'm having a lot of fun. 
I have never, I've never heard of that league before until. So the other thing we haven't unraveled or disclosed yet is that you also have a podcast. So I was listening to an mm-hmm. episode on your podcast and you guys mentioned that I've never heard of that before. So without giving away too much of your article, would you just share a little bit of how that league was operating? Yeah. So in the early seventies, I think it was 1971, uh, you know, Seattle had a pretty sizable uh, hippie community living here, as you could imagine. And um, a group of Seattle hippies were just kind of sitting around like, we should start a baseball league. Yeah. And they just started brainstorming and they came up with this derelict league and it followed the, the traditional rules of baseball, but they added their own unique rules to it. For instance, they didn't have an umpire out on the field. Uh, if there was some kind of dispute, they would just do a coin toss and settle it that okay. way. Okay. Uh, so they had these unique rules. They also had, um, there were three pitches. There were no strikes. There were no balls. The pitcher would throw three, three pitches. And that was right. it. That was, so what it, happened it, if I didn't, if I, you're the pitcher, I'm the batter, you throw me three, three, three pitches. I don't make contact. I'm out. Yeah. You were out according to their team. And the most important rule was uh, they had a keg of beer at every game. In the, in the dugout, there was a keg of beer. And that was uh, right. probably their top rule. So that kind of gives you an idea of the flavor of this derelict league. Uh, and they <laughs> lasted for uh, nearly a decade. And they had... That's crazy. They became really popular. They had all kinds of teams with all kinds of colorful names. The Crabs, the Losers... Uh, a number of taverns had their own teams. Uh, one of them was the Fremont Tavern Muff Divers. You know, really colorful names. Um, there was even a, a cult here called the Love Israel Cult. Have you ever heard of them? I have not. Okay. Yeah, they were this crazy cult, hippie cult that existed in Seattle in the 1970s. Uh, and they even started their own team as part of the Derelict League. So it was it was quite the quite the story. It was a fun one to research. I want, so when's that, when's that, come, what month is that going to be published? That's going to be in the November slash December issue of Seattle magazine. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to find a copy of that. That sounds very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, but okay. So not that you're uh, the, the rules master here, but I see, it seems to me, uh, was there any, do you know, was there any, why, why would you throw three pitches that were good to hit? Why didn't you just, you know, throw them, you know, I mean, if, if I'm out after three, three balls are thrown at me, why, why give me anything, you know, why? Yeah, I don't a, know. And I don't know how they disputed, like if it was a ball or strike, you know, that's cause that's kind of the whole nuance of baseball is balls yeah. and strikes. And that's kind of what makes it, but I don't know for whatever reason they did away with that rule and just the pitcher would throw, you know, three throws and then that was it onto the next one. Where were these games held? They went through the Seattle Parks Department, and so they would just play them at different uh, play fields and throughout the city. So think about this. And stuff. Yeah. Think about what you just said. In the 1970s, you went through the Seattle Parks Department to ar- arrange to have baseball games at a park. And we had kegs of beer in the dugouts. Nowadays, right. you wouldn't be able to do that. No, no. Different time yeah. back then. Very different time. Wow. All right. Yeah. And I have a feeling different uh, illicit substances were probably uh, enjoyed during the course of these M- games, too. Mo- most likely, You yes, know, during the 1970s, yeah. 1970s, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's okay. Well, let's go back. I, I derailed you about your book. So your first book out was the Seattle Prohibition book. Correct, right? yeah. And in that book, which I'm only halfway through, so I can't speak too articulately about it, but in that book, you introduced at least in the part, the first half, just briefly, this Alfred Hubbard guy. Mm -hmm. So help me out. I feel like I'm cheating on a test. Did he, is he part of the back half of the book? Do you remember? Uh, Yeah, he, he plays a pretty prominent role in that whole story. Um, I didn't profile him as much in the Seattle prohibition book as, as maybe I should have just because I had such, you know, you have only a certain amount of words that you're limited to. So you have to really right. kind of narrow down what you're going to cover. I probably could have doubled the amount of uh, how much I wrote. You wrote a book about him. I mean, there was obviously a I lot ended up writing a book about, about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 
so when you were when you were preparing the Seattle Prohibition book and you and you did you hear about Hubbard before? I mean, when did no. you? No, okay. it was during the research of the Seattle Prohibition book. I'd never heard of him before. So when I set out to write <clears throat> the Seattle Prohibition book, I had a list of names of people that I knew I wanted to cover. Like Roy Olmsted, for instance, was an obvious choice. You know, the right. area's top bootlegger. Um, Johnny Schnarr, the top rum runner of the area, uh, people like that. But <clears throat> Al Hubbard was not on my radar at all. Once I started getting deep into the research, though, his name started popping up in these really unusual ways. And at some point I realized, like, okay, who's this Al Hubbard guy? I'd never heard of him before, but obviously, you know, he, he's a big part of the story. So I kind of set everything aside, and I think I Googled his name, and uh, these very interesting results popped up, and I went straight down the Al Hubbard rabbit hole pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, and by the time I was Did done with my Prohibition book, I knew, like, okay – I know what my next book's going to be. So you, okay, you did. Okay. Yeah. So the prohibition book, the way, and once again, I'm only referencing the first half of the book, but the way you were describing Seattle in the 1910 to 15 range, Mm -hmm. I don't claim to know that much about history, but I do, I really do like history, but you were sharing things that I was like, I had no clue about. Mm -hmm. Um, But one thing that kind of stood out to me, was that the bootleggers and the rum runners, and I'm going to ask you to define both of those when you give your answer to the audience, um, seem to be fairly... Cor- well, they weren't shooting each other. Mm-hmm. They they seem to be collaborative, if you will, cooperative versus when Correct. you think of, like when you hear about things in, like, say, Chicago or New York, yeah. they weren't. Right. Do you have any opinion of why that might have been? that way but it, yeah let's go with that um yeah that the the culture here during prohibition you're right was a lot different than a lot of the other cities like over on the east coast where they're having shootouts and massacres and turf wars and stuff here um i'm not really sure what that is if it's kind of the laid-back scandinavian vibe the city's always had or what i'm mm-hmm. not sure but for whatever reason, we just didn't have that. Uh, you know, Roy Olmsted was called the gentleman bootlegger because he uh, he didn't allow his men to engage in violence. He didn't let, mm-hmm. let them carry guns because he didn't want that unwanted attention. He'd rather just pay somebody off than, you know, shoot them and drop right. a bunch of heat to himself. Um, so they called him the gentleman bootlegger. But that's kind of the vibe of what was going on here in Seattle during the time. They even had a bootleggers convention where all the area bootleggers met and they used yeah. uh, Robert's rules of order to democratically decide <laughs> on a set of rules, you know, such as prices and all that kind of stuff for the local bootlegging racket. So it was a lot different than the rest of the country in that See, regard. Yeah. Yeah. So for the audience that, cause you're using the book uses two terms that I never I guess when I thought of Rum Runner, I was thinking more of the Caribbean. Not, right. Not that. So how would you, so what's the definition of Rum Runner? Yeah. So that's a great question. I get that a lot. Um, so, a, so the, the difference between bootlegging and rum running is bootlegging is smuggling alcohol on land. Rum running is doing it on water. Uh, bootlegging came from this term from the civil war where soldiers would smuggle bottles of booze into the camp by putting it into their boots, bootlegging. I think you did that in high school too, right? Yeah, 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 right. Did... yeah I'm sure we did that at a few concerts. Um, yeah, and that's I, where that I, tra- I grew up in high school in the 70s where bell bottoms were popular. So, I mean, you, oh, you wasn't you like you're trying to stick a, a pint down your boots and wearing Levi's. So, okay. Right, right. Yeah, so it, that tradition carried on. Um, and okay. then, yeah, and rum running was doing it on the water. And here in... Uh, Puget Sound, uh, uh, booze was still legal up in Canada. Uh, So local bootleggers would hire local rum runners to get on their ships and go up to Canada. Usually Victoria or Vancouver were the top two destinations. And the Canadian um, liquor businesses quickly realized what a profitable setup this was for them. So they even had basically these a booze store set up on the wharves and they would just wait for the American customers to come in, load up their boats, take their money and then send them on their way. 
Wow. And then anyway, the, the rum runners would then smuggle the booze back to different places throughout the region, uh, Bellingham, Edmonds, Seattle, Everett, down to Tacoma. And mm -hmm. then once it hit land, the booze would then be loaded onto waiting uh, trucks. Um, and then from there, they would usually take it to like a horse stable or a, a, a garage, and it would be in these wooden crates, and they would just store it there. Uh, until they were able to sell it throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just, I mean, you think about that, you know, you're out on Puget Sound in a boat, and these weren't particularly large boats, right? They, these were no. designed to be pretty fast. Fast, yeah. Fast and yeah. then with a pretty decent-sized cargo hold. Right. Yeah. So So. That's, uh, we're about at the point where I, I've stopped reading that book. So I'm going to, for the sake of this you don't want any spoilers. Right. And I'm just going to encourage everybody that you need to go check out the book based on my, that's my half book review for you. Go check okay. it out. So Seattle mystic, Alfred M Hubbard. So this guy pops up in the, in the prohibition book as he ends up living in Olmstead's basement mm -hmm. and he was involved in prohibition on both sides, both, both. He was almost like a double agent. You know, he was working right. for the feds and he was working for the, for the bootleggers. But then he had some engine. It, I, what I didn't realize, and I, I either I overlooked it in, in, in the Hubbard book or you didn't bring it up when he demoed his boat. Yeah. He was only 24. Oh, he's younger than that. He was only, um, I think he had just turned 19. Yeah. See, that's just crazy to me. So yeah, he had this boat that seems very, um, almost like something out of national Enquirer, like not really believable. Like it's almost like right. a clickbaity headline. Right. But so he had this boat that was like, you know, earth's magnetism powered, if you will. Right. Am I, am I saying that? And yeah. Then, it was, it was the atmospheric power generator. It was this engine that he claimed extracted energy from the atmosphere and then could be used to, into convertible energy to power, you know, boats or cars or planes. Yeah. So, you know, wouldn't that be cool if that really was the case <laughs> today? So, but not only that though, so he was, he was, he did that, but he was also an electronics whiz. So he, did he start, no, help me out here because memory is a little fuzzy. And I only read, I read the book earlier this week, so it's, Really not good that I say this, is it? But radio, he, is he, he was one of the early pioneers of Seattle radio. Yeah, he, he um, so him and Roy Olmsted does, uh, built one of Seattle's first radio stations that Roy Olmsted operated from his house. Um, I think the original reason Olmsted built this is because he kind of saw the tea leaves that the feds were coming after him and had a target on his back and he wanted to come up with a business that he could fall back on outside of bootlegging that wouldn't land him in prison. So I think he, that's why he <laughs> built the radio station. According to local legend though, they were, uh, so his wife, Elise was also part of this whole radio venture. And in fact, she had her own program on this radio station of theirs in which she would read nursery rhymes to kids at night. Yeah. It's called right. the aunt Vivian radio hour or something like that. And, um, the legend holds that she would insert coded messages into her nursery rhymes that would help the rum runners and the bootleggers out there avoid being arrested by the cops. That's cool. That's a cool story. It is a cool story. Um, but anyway, so yeah, they built this radio station. Roy Olmsted eventually sold it when his legal trouble started mounting just to, as a way to generate some cash. And then it went through a series of owners and it continues to operate today as Como Radio, Como TV and yeah, Radio. That's... Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? All right. So, but Hubbard has this, so he, to me, he's got this first chapter, you know, where he was this inventor, this atmospheric engine, then he gets into bootlegging and radio. That's mm -hmm. chapter two. But then he's got this, like the second half of his life, if you will. Yeah. He became a, and why? Okay. I, I've read dozens of books about the Grateful Dead. I, I love listening to Grateful Dead music. Mm-hmm one of my favorite bands ever to go see live. It was, they were just, it was a magical experience. I saw him a couple times. 
Yeah. So yeah. If, where'd you see him at? I saw him down in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, when with, Little Feet opened for him? No, it was the uh, okay. it was the Indigo Girls. Remember oh wow! Them? Okay, I didn't yeah. I didn't go to that one. So I've read you know kind of this whole counterculture thing. I've read a lot of books, you know, and, and so you you hear references to to Kesey and, yeah. and to Timothy Leary and all this. And Hubbard's name should have popped up in those too. Right. And I never heard of this guy. Yeah, he's somehow he's remained very obscure, and that's kind of what I was hoping to do with my book is kind of break him more out in the open because he's so yeah. obscure. Nobody's barely anybody's yeah. heard of him. Yeah, yeah. if I, you ask the average person, even the average you know Grateful Dead fan and stuff, you know about Al Hubbard, and a lot of people don't. No, and and so I'm reading this, and I'm and I'm one of the th- thoughts that was running through my brain the entire time I'm reading this book about him from is that. How have I never heard this guy's story? It's, 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 and this is the, this is the compliment about your writing. It's a a historical book, but it reads like a novel. I mean, it reads, there's this great story going on and you, and you have a really accessible way of presenting it. Thank you. You know, people, people think history is boring. Memorizing facts and it's not though, but, this Hubbard story, I mean, it's almost like, I, I'm not, I'm kidding. I'm kidding you. It's like, are you sure you didn't make all this up? Because I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's yeah, just, it yeah. seems, it seems impossible that this one person. Had so many chapters, could, crazy chapters. Yeah. yeah. Crazy adventure, bootlegger, all this different stuff. You know, yeah. yeah, dual agent, if you will, and yeah. then you know, and then radio, and then and then he finds LSD. Yeah. What? So when you were doing the research for this, were you just constantly scratching your head, going, "What else am I going to find?" Oh, always, always. I mean, <clears throat> when you go, his his story was the probably the craziest rabbit hole I've ever gone down before. And I don't even know if I went all the way fully down it. Cause I don't know if that's possible with someone like Hubbard. Um, and there was, you know, even after writing the book, I went as deep as I could in my research and there's still unanswered questions that I'm really not quite hundred percent sure. Right. You, you, you know, the answers to, so. Yeah. It was, just, yeah. it was, it was a, that was, I loved reading that book. That was, a, that was a, a very, um, Thank you. Uh, it was a very pleasant surprise, frankly. It was very cool. And then you know, we're doing this backwards because normally when you talk, when an author's talking, they talk about their latest book. But mm-hmm. now we will. Let's talk about your latest book. And that's The the Lost Roadhouses of Seattle that you co-authored with Pete. It's Blecka, right? I asked Peter you Blecka, before. You know, yep. Yeah, Peter Blecka. Yep. And when I listened to a, a, a video with you guys sitting at the shanty. Mm-hmm. And... You, you got, and I hadn't listened to all of it. Um, but the thing, you, one thing I took away from that that I thought was very interesting is that uh, you guys collaborated on this, but you were interested in, in I-90 or you know, Highway 99, not I-90, mm-hmm. Highway 99. And he was off on the Bothell, Bothell Highway side of the, of the county, if you will. Correct. And I haven't read that book. Okay. I just picked it up. Well, I was trying to buy it. And your Amazon profile does not have that book listed. Oh, really? In a kin- in Kindle. Oh, you know, I think Kindle just came out like maybe a few days ago. Okay. And yeah, I looked Pete up, and it was Kindle on his profile. So I oh, just, interesting. I just purchased okay. It. I just purchased it. Okay. And um, so another sale for you. Um, walk me through, because okay, so you talk about the shanty, which is is, is a place I've been to. I don't know what else is in there because I haven't read it yet. So mm-hmm. what, what sort of research did you guys do and, and what was it like to collaborate with a, with an author versus doing it all yourself? Yeah, it actually went really good. And, you know, collaborating with someone can be tricky business. Um, Cause it, as you can imagine, if you have two different writers co-writing something, then you've got two different people, each with their own vision and writing style and things like that. So there's a, you know, a high chance of there being some conflict along the way with Pete and I, though, it went very smooth. Um, and I think Did because you just flip a coin, well, I had always, <laughs> it actually worked out really good because for a couple different reasons. Uh, one of them was that 
I had always been interested in the roadhouses on Highway 99 because I live not too far from Highway 99. I live up in Edmonds in this little place called Esperance, um, which butts up against Highway 99. I've lived there for over 25 years. And just as someone who's into kind of local, interesting, colorful history, uh, I knew about roadhouses for a while. So I've always been curious about them and kind of uh, low key research in them in some in different capacities throughout the years. Pete likewise lives not too far from um, what used to be the old Bothell Highway, what is now Bothell Way or Lake City Way. So that's mm-hmm. always been kind of his interest is the roadhouses that exist along there. So when he and I met for the first time and realized that we each had a mutual interest in these roadhouses, um, we discovered like that I was more into the Highway 99 ones. And, he was in the Botha one. So when we decided to collaborate on this book, it went pretty easy. We're just like, okay, well, I'll cover the 99 one, the Highway 99 ones, and you cover the Botha ones, and that's how we did it. So it was a pretty smooth Very operation. Cool. And the other thing I'll say is that, so Pete, the other thing that's really cool about this book is that Pete is probably the top historian when it comes to local Pacific Northwest music history. Mm-hmm. Uh, he used to write for the Rocket back in the the 80s and into the 90s he had a column about local music history he's wrote a number of books about it so when it comes to local music history he's he's the top guy and he was able to bring that element to the writing of this the roadhouse book that we worked on together because music was a big part of of these places right um and then for me you know my area of expertise is local prohibition and of course these roadhouses were a direct result of what was going on during prohibition so i was able to bring that layer to it so between the two of us we came up with this really cool rich history of these roadhouses and that i the end result we were both really happy with as a result of that okay. yeah is parker's in that yeah book? it is yeah okay. we definitely cover hey, parker's t- did you ever have your? Did you ever go to Parker's? I did. Yeah, back in the day, I think I saw a couple uh, heavy metal shows there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Parker's. Uh, back in the day, Parker's. Um, yeah. The shanty. The shanty in there. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. So it's it's it, this is an inter. I, I liked how you tied it all together and called it your your prohibition trilogy because I think that's a. I, I like the way you you kind of tied that all together. Um, for me, that makes it easy. Yeah. Now that book just came out. You were just released what a month ago. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And have you seen it on a bookstore shelf? I have. Yeah. A few different bookstores. You... Yeah. I've okay, popped we're, into we're... a few different bookstores to sign books. Um, well, my okay. local bookstore, uh, Edmund's bookshop which was one of my favorites just cause it's my community bookstore. Uh, they have stuff for sale. Third place books. Uh, Elliot okay. Bay. So is it still a rush to see your, 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 your baby out on the shelf? It is. It is. Yeah. 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 It's still okay. very cool. That's cool. And are you guys doing a lot of book promotion for it? Yeah, we did. You know, when your book comes out, usually the first three months is kind of the sweet spot because there's a lot of excitement over the fact that this book was just released. And mm-hmm. so you try to, as an author, you try to seize upon that. So we've been doing a lot of different interviews with local papers and stuff. I was just on um, the spot on Como news called Eric's heroes and mm-hmm. which he profiled the shanty and uh, he interviewed me for it. So yeah, we've been doing quite a bit. Well, you know, I'm reading, you know, here in, you know, Cairo, Seattle refined NPR King five evening, you know, you've, you've hit all the, all the hot spots, if you will, of, of, of media. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. The other thing though, is besides being an author and holding down a day job, because this is, this is your, we'll call it your side hustle. Cause that's the, there you the go. current buzzword. It's your side hustle. <laughs> there you go. But on the other side hustle is dim lights and stiff drinks, the dive bars of Seattle. Mm-hmm. And you've got some co-hosts there. So how, how did you guys come up with, the idea to do a podcast because now that like, this is, like I said, this is episode, my 222nd episode. Yeah. I had no idea when I started this, that I would do it this much and I enjoy it. So what's your journey like been with podcasting? Yeah. So, um, 
it's with a couple of friends of mine that I've known since the nineties. We've been longtime friends and um I think we were just sitting around one day, probably at some bar, like, what should we do for a pot? We should do a podcast. What could we do? And we were just kind of brainstorming different ideas. And one of us came up with like, oh, you know, we should do like a dive bar podcast. That's kind of interesting. So we just kind of took that idea and went off running with it. And so what we do for the podcast is we visit a different local dive bar or historical drinking establishment. Um, it's been around for a long time. We visit the place and we record our podcast live at that location, wherever we're visiting. Mm -hmm. And then we go over the history of it. So it's been able, it's another opportunity for me to um, explore local history in kind of a unique and interesting way by right. going over the history of these places. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. We've really enjoyed yeah. it. Putting you on the spot. What's the, if, if you were to get a, so we're recording this on a Saturday. <clears throat> okay. So Saturday afternoon, you're going to go down to one of the past dive bars that you've recorded episodes in. Where are you going to go and have a beer and what beer would you have? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Huh. Well, if I was going to hit a dive bar tonight, I would probably hit Daryl's Tavern on Aurora Avenue. So uh, I, I guess it would be in the Shoreline area. It's been around for a long right. time. Yep. Uh, I love that place. That's one of my favorites. Uh, and as okay. far as what beer I would have, gosh, it depends what they have on tap. I would probably either have an, a hazy IPA uh, mm -hmm. or a Rainier Tallboy. Because sometimes, depending <sighs> where you're at, a rainbow... Uh, a Rainier Tallboy uh, is just what the doctor ordered for a good dive bar. You know, it's just it just uh, fits in. I, I can't I can't argue that your 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 prescription is accurate, but you're not. A I fan may of the be Rainier. the only person. I'm not a fan of the Rainier. That's okay. I never. I just. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of those old one. lagers. It's like Budweiser or Miller. You know, it's like. Yeah, but like I. This beer. Yeah. Well, like. Yeah, so the first beer I ever had a sip of was in, with my dad at a friend's house, and it was an ice cold Olympia, and that still strikes <laughs> me as maybe the the most yeah, magical taste I ever had in my life. But Rainier's one, I just never. That's I, okay. I know people complain. I'll get hate mail over the fact that I'm disrespecting Rainier. Yeah, super iconic brand in the Seattle area. I I love yeah. love their advertising. Their yeah. advertising in the '70s was was absolutely always the best. Um, yes, absolutely. They're making a documentary just, about that right now. Are they? Yeah. Uh, I, I forget okay. who it is, but they just came across this. They have this whole trove of old Rainier beer commercials, you know, all those classic oh, cool. ones. And so they're yeah. doing a documentary on it. I can't wait until it comes out. Uh, if would, if would you please ping me and tell me when that's out so I can sure. go, if I don't, you yeah, I'll do the same if I hear, but yeah, yeah. I, that sounds magical. Yeah. So, so you guys, you know, dim license stiff drinks, great, great title. And, the episode I listened to was about Slim's, okay. which is not an old bar. Right. So it, it's a, a new entrant into the dive bar culture of Seattle, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I loved how you guys were kind of describing how is how they put it. I'm not doing it justice, but basically look around and uh, when did this bar open? And uh, was it 2008 it opened? That, that sounds opened? right. Yeah, I think so. Something. Close so we're going to say 2008, close enough for this episode. No, no, no research done. But one of your co-hosts said something and that was the last time this place was deep cleaned and <laughs> it, it's but it's i don't want to say it's true but i've been to slims and it yeah. has that it has that feel that that's part of its don't charm turn the lights yeah i don't don't turn the lights on i really don't want to get a good look at where i'm standing <laughs> yeah so daryl's tavern that's your that's your kind of your i like daryl's yeah i like daryl's okay Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Daryl's has uh, been there a few times. That's uh now when we talked on the phone, you guys might be expanding outside of the, the Seattle area with the show. Possibly. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, no, that's correct. Um, yeah, there's just some cool historic drinking establishments outside of the Seattle city limits. So we don't want to just limit ourselves just to Seattle. We'd like to go out, mm -hmm. you know, for example, there's a couple really cool ones in Everett. You and I talked about uh, a couple places down in Tacoma. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. we're going to definitely start doing that. That would be – I also thought of another one uh, in Tacoma, Magoo's Annex. Magoo's. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Magoo's is a, is a long-time uh, dark 
dark, dank place yeah. <laughs> with, with an interesting music history too. Yep. Yep. Now I always ask my guests, you know, now from Seattle, I'm kind of afraid what you're going to answer, but you know, you drink coffee, right? Correct. You kind of live in the Edmonds area. Mm-hmm. Where's your go-to coffee spot? Uh, there's a place in downtown Edmonds called Walnut Coffee on Walnut Avenue. Um, and I like yeah. that. It just has a cool vibe to it. It's good. You know, mm-hmm. you always see people that you know, and it's always a, a, a booth where I can sit down with my laptop. And so that's where I usually go. So are you able to work? Uh, can you concentrate in a, in a coffee shop and work? It depends what I'm doing. If, um, if I'm doing like some, some intense writing, I prefer to just kind of be by myself isolated somewhere. But if I'm doing something right. light or maybe some research or something, I'm, I can do that in a coffee shop. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Any other coffee? So what's your beverage of choice? What do you, what's your coffee cho- coffee choice? What's your go-to coffee drink? Oh, I just like drip coffee with maybe a little bit of cream, a little bit of sugar. I don't like to get too fancy. If yeah. Fancy oh. to me is maybe like a latte. <gasps> yeah, I know. Yeah, but Don't say oat milk, please. Please, I beg you, don't say oat milk. <laughs> uh, interesting places to grab a bite to eat in the Edmonds area. Oh, man. Well, Probably in the last couple of years, Edmonds has really upped its food game, and there's actually some really exciting restaurants. Um, so there's uh, Fire and Iron is a good place. There's a um, Filipino and Hawaiian fusion place called Barcada that's really good. And then along Highway 99 in Edmonds area, <clears throat> there's all kinds of incredible. Um, Asian restaurants, everything from Korean fried chicken to ramen places to pho to uh, Chinese restaurants from like very specific provinces. So I I would say, in fact, they're they're starting to call it the international district. And I would say, you know, the the restaurants, the level of restaurants that you can find on Highway 99 in this area rivals those in the international district in downtown Seattle. It's there's some incredible places that are opening. Yeah. Because 20 years ago, that's – right. I, I lived up in the Lake, Lake Forest Park area. So, you know, yeah. 20 years ago, 99 was not right the best place in the world to grab food. No, okay. you might have a couple of greasy spoons, but, yeah, nothing like what, yeah. what there is there is now. Is there a ta- – in my memory serving correct, is there a tavern called Harvey's? Correct. Yeah, there is a tavern called Harvey's. With the neon sign that's kind yeah. of a rabbit? I love that, okay. that sign. Yeah, it closed yeah, for a, a while and it just recently reopened, like maybe in the last couple months. I just oh, okay. was was there as part of a um, newspaper article they did on, on the book. And so I was just inside there recently. Okay. Yeah. Is it still got the same old? Yeah. Or have they freshened it up? Or They freshened it up a little. I can't tell if they have a new owner or not or what, what the story is there, but uh, it pretty much looks the same as it did before. Yeah. Okay. So when you're not writing, researching, and and uh, finding old things, what do you like to do? What else do you do for fun and excitement? Gosh, I feel like that's all I've been doing the last uh, three or four years is just writing. But I like to um, <clears throat> I like to work out my yard. I'm, I'm into gardening and stuff like that. So probably my spare okay. time is usually spent out my yard or spending time with my family. Uh, I like movies. I'm a a movie buff. I have been a movie buff for a long time. So if I can squeeze in a, a movie or two on a weekend, that's usually good for me. So that's, that's right. for me. All right. Last two questions. Yeah. What didn't I ask you that I should have? Hmm. Nothing that I can think of. I think you covered everything. Great. Yeah. I can't think of anything okay. that you didn't, didn't cover. Actually there's, there's three, three questions. Sorry. So you got two okay. more to go. All right. This one's very important. Okay. I'm stealing this one from another uh, Seattle area uh, person. Okay. Tried it out. I actually kind of like it. Cake or pie? <laughs> and, why? and why? I'm more of a cake person, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as far as why, I don't know. I, I think I just like more the the cake quality of it, if you will, rather than like a pie, okay. like a fruit filling or something like that. So a good, like chocolate cake to me is, 
That's a good dessert. Okay. Yeah. There's no wrong answer here. Right, right, right. right. No, there's, not, there's, there's no wrong answer. Okay. Right, right. So the last thing is, where can people find out more about you, about your books, your podcast? Where, where, should, we, where should we send them? I have my own website, so it's bradholden.org, um, and from there, you know, you can. There's links to my podcast, links to my books, um, or you can go to my Instagram page, which is uh, Seattle Artifacts on Instagram. Uh, there's a lot of information about you know different things I'm finding and stuff like that, um, and I also have my own Twitter account, which is under my yep. name, Brad Holden. So any of those three places would be good. All right. Well, Brad, thank you for taking the time. This has been a lot of fun for me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. This was a good convo. And uh, I'm looking forward to finish. So I'm halfway done with your three books. So I'm going to, you know, I'll report back to you when I'm 100% completed. But so far, uh, the yeah. Seattle Prohibition book was super strong so far. The Holden book is, I, I'm still not convinced you just didn't make it up. I'm <laughs> just pretty sure you made up most everything because it's, bizarre story yeah it's just yeah no it's incredible un unbel and then the roadhouses will be interesting to see my not that i'm an expert because i'm not but like you'll mention places and i'll go oh i've been there and what's my experience been like at some of these places so i'm looking forward to, to filling that in and i'll keep listening to the podcast and uh yeah thanks for being thank you for having me on it's been great Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.